Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to WMG uh, Steel Group Colloquium. Today we have a great speaker, uh, Phil Withers, who doesn't need any uh, specific introduction, especially in material community in the UK. He is very well known. Um, Phil Withers is the first Regius Professor of Materials at the University of Manchester and a fellow of the Royal Society FRS. Royal Academy of Engineering and a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. He is the chief scientist of the Henry Royce Institute for Advanced Materials. The Royce Institute brings together the universities of Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Oxford, Cambridge, Cranfield, Strathclyde and Imperial College, NNL and UK Atomic Energy to support the accelerated design of new materials and a better understanding of existing ones. He has pioneered the use of X-ray CT and electron microscopy to undertake a correlative multi-scale, multi-model and time-lapse characterization to follow the behavior of engineering materials often in 3D and expose it to demanding environments in operando. In 2008, Phil sets up the Henry Mosley X-ray imaging facility one of the most extensive suits of X-ray imaging facilities in the world with a special focus on in-situ time-lapse 3D X-ray imaging. It is now part of the UK National Research Facility for Lab, for lab X-ray CT. In 2014, the facility was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to speak and, and also a little disappointing that I can't be with you. Uh, it would be great to come. I, I have obviously we have strong links with Warwick, uh, both in the X-ray Imaging Centre through uh, the National X-ray CT Centre, but also our combined interest in metals is, is a really powerful uh, uh, bond uh, across the two facilities. So, yeah, so my topic today was really a building on some of the things you mentioned about combining electron microscopy, uh, X-ray imaging to try and understand materials um, and metals in particular. So all of my examples will be from metals. Uh, I'll also just briefly explain a bit about the ROIS for those of you who don't know so much. Uh, thank you for the very short introduction there. And, and I think um, one of the things I want to say is that the ROIS Institute is in one sense made up of those individual partners, but is actually um, it's about bringing together the whole of the UK. So I see my role as chief scientist very much as reaching out to academics from across the UK to say, get involved in the activities of the Royce, because the Royce's Institute is really there to, to, to advance materials and to raise the profiles of the materials. We're having a national strategy meet, uh, being developed at the moment that we're facilitating. Uh, and if you have really strong views on what we need to do in the UK to, to do, make the advanced materials really the, the topic it deserves to be, then uh, do get in contact. Um, if you want to use our facilities or you want to take part in some of the activities, uh, do get involved because it, it, it's not about, it's not just about facilities and individual partners, it's about a, a nationwide community of material scientists. So people often ask me, who's in the Royce? And I say, well, everyone is, can be in the Royce. Uh, and, and I hope that, you know, you will, you will, uh, you know, we, we, we write lots of letters of support, for example, to support young researchers or to support infrastructure where we see it has been really critical to the UK. And of course, in Warwick, you, you have a very, you have some very special focus on, on manufacturing and on steels, uh, which are really important to the UK. Um, so, as you said, we have a number of facilities and each facility is trying to lead on a different uh, aspect. So in Sheffield, it's advanced metals processing. In Leeds, in Imperial, in Cambridge, it's, it's what we call atoms to devices, making materials from the atom upwards. It's a Liverpool. It's about chemical materials and making materials by test tubes and formulation at uh, at uh, NNL and AA technology and in Manchester we lead on the nuclear area. At Oxford they lead on batteries and electrochemical systems and in Manchester we also have activities in what I call materials for demanding environments and I'll show you some of my work on materials in demanding environments but also biomedical materials and of course uh, 2D materials which uh, obviously reflects the heritage here. Um, but we try and support materials across the, the whole spectrum. 
And uh, there, there's a, a short list of those areas I just mentioned, but we also have a whole range of facilities. So, uh, you know, any of the facilities that I show today, if you would like to get involved and, and, it would, and they would benefit your research or benefit the research of your PhD students, we have a PhD student access program and, and students can come from anywhere across the UK to use our facilities. So uh, if it's a particular electron microscope or particular X-ray imaging, you're very welcome to come. As I say, lots and lots of facilities, largely broken down into making, lots of making. I think in the UK, we probably don't make enough materials. We we, we don't make as, as many materials as maybe if you look at places like China, where they're constantly making new materials and trying to do new things. Um, but a, a big emphasis on make, a big emphasis on characterize, uh, test, evaluate, and a big, a, a big uh, focus on imaging and, uh, imaging and uh, analysis. So across those make, test, imaging and analysis, we have a, a lot of facilities and, and you can you can access just one piece of kit or you can put those together to try and make materials, test materials, and image materials. OK, so as far as what I wanted to say, we all understand that uh, uh, materials have a very wide range of length scales. I remember Harry Badisha used to say, you know, metals are, you know, the first nanotechnology, you know, material metals have been designed at the nanoscale for a very long time. Uh, but whether you're interested in natural materials, whether you're interested in ge geological materials, or metals, composites, electronics, whatever you're interested in, we need to understand them at a range of length scales. And I just want to start by looking at how do we interrogate the different length scales. So if you like, what's in our 3D characterization toolbox? So uh, I'm going to start at the low end. And uh, in, when I was a student, we used to use broad iron beam, and it was a very difficult thing making a transmission electron microscopes sample. And you, you, you kind of it was just potluck what you where the hole occurred, and it was potluck what materials you had around the edge of your TM sample. But now we have the ability with dual beam microscopes to mill away materials and to produce 3D images of materials at uh, a range of scales. If we use gallium fibs, we can look at regions of tens of microns. And if we use plasma fibs, xenon plasma fibs, for example, we can image maybe hundreds of microns. And we can create a 3D image by serial sectioning, just like we would if you wanted to look inside a, a, a loaf of bread. You could look inside the loaf of bread by going to an X-ray facility, or you could cut it with a knife and build up a 3D, uh, a 3D image from a series of slices. So 3D uh, serial sectioning has now become very automated and we can create really detailed maps at the sort of uh, submicron scale. So um, that's that leads you up to a, regions of interest of about a few hundred microns. And, uh, and, and as I said, from, you know, obviously TM tomography takes you down to sub nanometer and dual beam microscopes take you to the tens of nanometers scale. So you can create really detailed 3D images. And then at the other end of the scale, we have X-ray imaging and you have a really good X-ray imaging facility led by uh, Mark Williams and, and Jay Warnett at, uh, at, uh, at um, Warwick in WMG. And, and you can access those facilities through the National Research Facility for Lab X-ray CT, which I'm involved in. But of course, the basic principle in which this works is that you take a series of X-ray images and then from those series of 3D, uh, from those series of 2D X-ray images, you put together a 3D image. And that 3D image, once you have a 3D image, you can cut it and slice it in any way you like to look at a particular section. And because it's non-destructive, you can go back and image it again. So you can see how things degrade or how things change as you process them by repeatedly taking 3D images. There was a little bit of a compromise with 3D imaging because generally the size of the sample or the size of the region that you can image affects the resolution that you can achieve as well. So generally we get spatial resolutions about a thousand to two thousand times smaller than the size of the field of view. So if you're imaging something which is a millimeter in size, 
you can probably look at a at a micron resolution. But if you're imaging something that's uh, 100 millimeters in size, then you, you're going to be talking about uh, much, much lower resolutions, maybe 100 microns or so. So the size of the object or the size of the imaging volume and the, si and the, and the pixel resolution go hand in hand. And that is a bit of a disadvantage with X-ray imaging. And of course, you need to be able to get the X-rays through your system. So generally, we look at small objects with low energy X-rays and we look at large objects with very hard X-rays. So the higher the energy, the deeper the penetration. So we can look at materials of uh, in steels. We can image uh, regions of many inches, uh, many, many tens of tens of centimeters, even if you have very hard X-rays. So. Hard X-ray imaging, you can go through very significant amount of steel. But uh, in our lab, we probably wouldn't look at materials much more than uh, maybe 10 millimeters in, in, in cross-sectioning of steel, for example. So that sort of gives you a lot of information about things like additive manufacturing. And uh, I see people here, I know people here who've used, uh, looking in the audience, people who've done additive manufacturing and looked at X-ray imaging to look at defects and additive manufacturing. And then there's this little gap between, uh, between the, the, the CT and, and the PFIB, uh, where samples are maybe of the order of a millimeter in size, or the region of interest is of the order of a millimeter size, but you want to get resolutions in the micron or submicron scale. And recently we've developed uh, the, the, the uh, laser tri-beams have been developed, where you can use a laser to do some of the large cutting and then maybe polishing and cleaning with the PFIB. And this means now you can excavate regions of many millimeters in size. So you could, for example, uh, have, a, have a, 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 a maybe a turbine blade. You could image that at, uh, at uh, micronish resolution. You could identify whether a defect or inter interesting bits of the microstructure. And then you can use a tri-beam laser to cut that region out and, and, and investigate it in a correlative workflow. So what you have in these systems is a laser beam uh, at about, oops, about 60 degrees, uh, a PFIB at maybe 50 degrees on the other side, and, an, and a scanning electron microscope. So you can use these in turn to slice, to polish, and to image the material. And uh, so we've moved from gallium fibs, which are, of, of, as I say, of tens of microns through uh, through argon broad iron beam, which will do hundreds of microns, but at low uh, at low uh, depth, to xenon PFIBs, which will go up to hundreds of microns, to the laser PFIB, which will uh, excavate hundreds of many hundreds of microns. Here you can see it, the microstructure of a an aluminium alloy, uh, where the sample is of a millimeter style dimensions. And of course, we have time scales. So we often not only want to be able to image over 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 different length scales, we want to be able to image over time scales. This is a, an image I put together, a figure I put together in 2014, and it just categorized all the X-ray CT systems or many of the X-ray systems around the world at different facilities at, at the European Synchrotron, Spring 8, uh, the, the Diamond Light Source and so forth as well as a few uh, lab systems and Nikon systems and some of the x radius systems. And firstly, what you see is as, as you go to higher and higher spatial resolution, as you go to higher and higher spatial resolution, the time to acquire a 3D image gets longer. And I've assumed you need about a thousand radiographs for every image. So this is the time to collect a thousand images as you rotate the sample. And you can see that if you want to work at 0.1, micron resolution, for example, at that time, it would take maybe 100 seconds to collect the data uh, at a synchrotron. So the synchrotron CT is really good at very high speed acquisition. And, and the, this ellipse has moved to towards the bottom left hand corner because we now have higher flux instruments and we have better detectors. So we can now go faster and faster. We can actually take images at about 100,000 frames a second at the fastest speed. And you can see here radiographs, for example, of additive manufacturing that we collected. And you can see the track moving from right to, uh, from right to left here as you, as you melt the, uh, the powder and, and, and form a track. And we can image 
as I say, somewhere between 10,000 and, and 100,000 frames per second. But of course, not all things happen that quickly, and there are some things that happen much more slowly. So you, a lab CT has a really important place in 4D imaging, so in time-based imaging. Here is, this is an experiment we did with the nuclear, or with EDF, and this is looking at the corrosion or the oxidation of a, of a boiler tube. And what you can see is the oxidation over hundreds of hours. So this CT experiment went to 5,000 hours, and we can see how the how the oxide forms on the on, on the boiler tube as a function of time, and we can plot that uh, over many hundreds uh, of hours. That experiment was an ex situ experiment, so we would move it between the X-ray system and and the uh, and the furnace, and so we would uh, take this. This would take many trips between the the, the furnace and and, and the and the uh, X-ray CT system to build up a pattern of what's going on, and you can see that different rate, different different tubes would 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 uh, oxidize at, at different temperature at different rates. We can also do time-based imaging in the scanning electron microscope and in the, of course, in the TM. And a lot of in-situ work is now being done around the world. What we envisaged, I don't know why my slide wants to go on. Uh, um, what we envisaged was uh, an in-situ microscope, so a microscope that would be designed to run autonomously, because some experiments, when you start heating materials up, they, the sample starts to move. When you start deforming samples, the region of interest starts to move, the focus may change, the illumination conditions may change. So what we wanted was a microscope that we could run for days, but run it autonomously. So we could set up a region of interest we could put through a series of thermal or mechanical cycles and record that information over a period of days or even weeks. Um, and I'll show an example of that later. We have two of these systems in Manchester. And if you're particularly interested in in situ experiments, looking at say thermal changes as a function of heating and thermal cycling or creep deformation or uh, uh, diffusion taking place over many hours, uh, this is a really, a really neat way of doing experiments. You can see a little tensile stage in the bottom left here. Okay, so we have, that's our toolbox, if you like. So what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of an insight into some of the, some of the projects we've been doing and in the hope that that might inspire you to, uh, to, to look at degradation using some of these, some of these techniques and te technologies. So this was an experiment we did for, for BP. It took two weeks. And the aim was to try and understand the pitting that goes on in a pipeline steel. So this is a piece of pipeline steel in a chloride solution. And you can see that the pits are forming and the, actually it looks like the pits are forming on the surface, but actually traditionally in this case, they form beneath the surface. And um, uh, uh, Alison Davenport has done quite a lot of work in Birmingham looking at these lacy veils that form over these corrosion pits. So when you look at the surface, you just see very fine holes, but beneath the surface, you see this, uh, this extensive corrosion. And of course, using imaging, you can study which is the fastest, which is growing the slowest, which ones start quickly and then slow down, which ones don't incubate for some time, and you can pick the ones you're interested in. So we can then pick one of these pits and understand what's going on. So you can then go from medium resolution uh, X-ray imaging to high resolution X-ray imaging. And you can see now that the pit is covered by this lacy veil and the material is created a little in micro environment some beneath the surface. And we can follow that in time non-destructively. But we also want to understand the shape of that pit and the shape of that pit is very important from a structural integrity viewpoint, and it comprises what you might call traditional pitting corrosion, but also intergranular corrosion. And you can see what looks like intergranular corrosion there. And so you can see we can segment that into a sort of blue pit and a red uh, intergranular uh, corrosion. And we can then start to understand, well, OK, what's happening at the intergranular level? Uh, and we can then uh, say, well, OK, can we identify a part of that intergranular corrosion to look at in more detail? So we can now move from X-ray imaging to, um, to serial sectioning FIB. So what we did was we transferred the same region 
uh, we superimpose the image of the uh, of the uh, pit on the SEM image. And you can see in this bottom left in purple, the pit underneath the surface. And we took the extremity of the pit and we dug down to see what was going on. And we could then take a serial sections to look at the intergranular corrosion that's taking place. And we can then produce a 3D image of the intergranular corrosion, which you can see in blue here. The next step was to say, well, OK, what's so special about these these grain boundaries? Can we understand the crystallography of these grain boundaries? And of course, we can use electron backscatter diffraction to understand the crystallography. In fact, here we used uh, we used um, uh, uh, transmission um, uh, backscatter diffraction, if you like, to, to do that. But you, TKD. But you can see very clearly here the different grains. You can see that there are. There are twin boundaries, there are twin boundaries between the grains in some grains, and we can see certain features. We can understand the crystallography. And then we can take a TM section of the same piece, and we can understand the material's chemistry in a, in a, in a, a, a chemist stem. So you can see that we have a quite a long journey here, taking different machines and looking at the same corrosion pit. And at the end, we can we can we can understand what's going on at the grain boundary, the chemical segregation of coro of chromium to the boundaries. So I think, you know, the point I would like to make is that through this series, we've got lots of different places where we or different length scales. We could interrupt the process. We could interrupt the process by preventing access to the surface by paints. We can. Uh, start to affect the intergranular growth of uh, so the, here we can see the lacy veil over the surface. We can we can affect the, the grain boundary uh, corrosion by changing the grain boundary structures and grain size and texture, and we can change the um, atomic scale um, uh, the atomic scale corrosion by changing the atoms that segregate to those boundaries and by using heat treatments to control that segregation. So at different length scales, we've got different strategies for uh, for um, controlling what goes on in that material. But it's useful to be able to study it progressively from sample to sample. And what happened here was somebody did the, the X-ray imaging and they passed the coordinates and the sample to the person who did the focused ion beam. And they took the images from the focused ion beam and the coordinates from the focused ion beam and handed them to the person who did the transmission electron microscopy. And, and we were able to pass both the physical specimen, but the, if you like, the GPS of, of where in the, in the sample we were looking so that we could connect all the bits together. And of course, you know, there, there's a whole range of, uh, of, um, of trajectories that you can, you can put together. You, you can, by combining uh, 3D imaging with chemical imaging, with crystallographic imaging, with mechanical testing, you can, you can evaluate the properties the crystallography, the chemistry, the, the, the microstructure at these different length scales and put all that information together. And in this case, you know, we move from macro CT to micro CT. We cut out a sample with gallium fib. We did the uh, fib sem imaging and then we cut out a TM sample to do the transmission electron backscattered diffraction and the chemical imaging. But you can think of lots of these kind of work workflows. And I think, you know, a number of manufacturers are, are thinking about how do we make this easy to do? I'm going to show a few other examples of bringing together different techniques that we've used. This is imaging grain boundary corrosion. But in this case, we've used we've measured the, the grain boundaries and the, and the grain boundary structures by diffraction. So instead of doing it post-mortem by electron backscattered diffraction, we're able to do it by something called a diffraction contrast tomography, where we can image the grain boundaries by um, CT. And that means we can look at the intergranular corrosion that's taking place on a fine wire, and we can monitor that over time, both the, image, both the, the cracking by imaging, but also the uh, grain structure by diffraction contrast tomography. And this was taken some time ago. Uh, Andy King, who was a student, is now an instrument scientist at Soleil in France. But you can see both the CT image, the gray scale CT image with the intergranular corrosion. And then we can put on top of that the grain structure as recorded by diffraction contrast tomography. 
And of course, you can relate one to the other and see how they change with time. So in this instance, we could take that small region of the crack and understand how does that crack grow through this structure as time goes on. And we can, we can collect a movie of that intergranular corrosion that takes place. So that's the combination of two tomography techniques to build a time series uh, and understand uh, the, the bridging ligaments, the relation, the, the speed of, of corrosion along, along different grain boundaries. And, and you can see here, there are some bridging ligaments where the grain boundaries have been resistant to corrosion and they help to hold the crack together. This, this experiment, that experiment was done at the European Synchrotron using the, uh, the, the beam lines there, ID19 and ID11. Um, this experiment is looking at stress corrosion in an aluminium alloy uh, using lab CT. And again, what we wanted to understand was the nature of that corrosion and to follow it over time, because uh, some of the emerging alloys are showing themselves to be very susceptible. Some of the, some of the new alloys are showing themselves to be very susceptible to uh, uh, stress environmentally controlled cracking. So again, one of the things we can do is we can relate the 3D structure as observed by electron backscattered diffraction on the left with the crack as it grows by um, computed tomography. And you can see that in this case, we create what I call fingers as the crack grows some parts of it grow faster than others. And you can see the orientations from the diffraction as well. So we can get a really good picture of the corrosion front and how the corrosion front meanders through the, meanders through the material. And what, what we can also do that in this case is we combine that with optical imaging of the surface. So we can actually see in this case how the crack grew under three point bending. And we can actually see that in time. So we can see how a crack is initiating on the left and we can watch that crack growing in time and we can take it out of that this environment and study uh, study the 3D nature uh, so, sort of in the same same workflow. So what we did here was we, we uh, combined X-ray imaging of the crack with destructive serial sectioning by, by uh, electron microscopy to understand the nature of that crack. And you can see here that we've taken that crack, we cut it out with a, a fib and, and produce a, a block, and then we serially section that block uh, to create a 3D image of that crack, because we wanted to know not just the nature of the crack, but we wanted to understand its relationship relative to, uh, relative to the, uh, the crystalline structure. So we wanted to do EBSD, and X-ray imaging at the same time. And you can see on the left, the, uh, the simple SEM image, and on the right, you can see the EBSD image as we went through this material. So this is a, a material, maybe a few hundred microns, maybe 300 microns across, and we can see the crack over many hundreds of microns. And that's important because obviously we want to understand the transition to a, to a long crack. And you can, you know, obviously, as you, you can then take that apart and you can start to look at but crack bifurcation. You can look at how different grain boundaries are successful in, in deviating the crack. We can understand how nucleation occurs at the surface. You can see this is initiation. In, this is a, a material where, where, where you're initiating a small crack at the, at the surface and, and that crack is growing in and that crack forms at a small pore near the surface or at the surface. Um, and we can look at this statistically because we've got lots and lots of data. So we can look at uh, what which grain boundaries are, are, are growing fastest. We can look at uh, which grain boundaries seem to form these uh, deviations and, and, and so forth. And we can we can understand the role of intermetallic particles as well. So you can see certain intermetallics in these slices. So we can really just sort of afterwards, we can really Cut, cut, look at the sample data set and understand what, what is going on. OK, this example, I, I've called this degradation, you, 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 it, but this is creep and understanding creep in magnesium alloys. And people have been drawing pictures of magnesium creep for many, well, certainly since 1960s, certainly the, from the time when I was born, people have been talking about grain boundary sliding and how grain boundaries are accommodating superplastic creep. So what we wanted to do was to apply new techniques or existing, you know, modern techniques to try and understand this process. And you can see 
clearly the kind of the 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 the, the uh, sharing of different grains here and you can see the the how this uh, scratch on the surface has uh, formed a jog where the grain boundaries are, seem to be sliding so we wanted to study that at room temperature so what we've done is use digital image correlation so we 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 basically put spots on the surface <laughs> Uh, many, many millions of spots by a deposition and uh, uh, process. And uh, we create uh, uh, these very, very fine nanometer scales, uh, di uh, gold spots. And those spots can be imaged in the SEM. So you can see here each image, I'll stop this one for a moment. Each image here is, oops, each image is the composite of many, many images. So this image on the right might have 100 images. So it might be 10 images across, 10 images high. Each one is broken down into a series of subregions, as you can see in the top left. We then correlate between the top left and the, and the middle, one, middle left, and we build up a, a, a digital map of the formation. And you can see the deformation patterns that you get on the right. So this is a traditional material. Um, I think it's a steel, but it's uh, you can see the, the or maybe a nickel base alloy. Actually, I think this is a nickel base alloy. Yes, it is. 718. So in 718, you can see the slip lines. You can see how iso isotropic the slip is. You can see a number of features during the process. Um, and this strain experiment included, uh, you can see every red point on here is an acquisition. So there's maybe a, a hundred different images in the sequence, each one comprising a hundred sub images. And all of that data is collected uh, automatically. So we looked at uh, we looked at straining in, in AZ31 at room temperature, and we looked at straining at temperature uh, at about 200 degrees centigrade. And these experiments are taking place at a strain rate of about 10 to the minus six. Now, you know, 10 to the minus six means you're going to have to deform this very, very slowly. And we acquired the images during straining. And what you see on the right is something which is fairly akin to a traditional deformation. There's some twinning. You'll, if you look carefully, you'll see some twinning in the material because of it's AZ31, and you'll see some dispersed slip. On the right, the, these are what I call it. These images are between one image and the next image. So these are not not summing the the information. They they, they we we build it up uh, 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 by taking the difference between one image and the next image. And what you can see really clearly here is that the grain boundaries are moving. So you'll see grain boundaries are moving laterally. Uh, you can see, for example, the ones in the middle there are moving laterally. I don't know if I can, maybe I can mark that with a pen. So if you look in this sort of region here, you'll see grain boundaries are moving. Um, and and and, uh, and you'll see also there's a lot of shear. So the shear is the, indicated by the colors. So you can see that unlike the case at room temperature, most of the shear is accommodated not by the um, not by the grains, but by the movement between grains and also the movement of green grains laterally. So you've got grains sliding parallel, if you like, or shearing. They're not sliding, shearing parallel to their grain boundaries, but they also have quite a lot of mobility normal to their grain boundaries. And you'll see some really lovely little effects here. If you look carefully, you see this grain boundary, for example, grows, it grows out into the next grain. If you look as that reruns, you see how it grows and forms a new grain. So we have got many grains that are rotating and, and manipulating slowly, but we've got other new grains that are nucleating and growing. So we have a very mobile set of grain boundaries. Yeah, and you, you may be able to see that better in that square, in those squares there. You can see that grain boundary in the top right just growing and you'll see a grain boundary movement in the bigger square as well. So quite, quite interesting how the grain boundary, how grains are moving and very important because clearly what we want, if we want to have super plastic flow, we need to make sure that all that grain boundary movement is accommodated without the formation of pores or voids at, at triple points, which is what tends to happen if you don't accommodate all that strain. OK, um, another example, this one from reactor pressure vessel steels, um, just trying to understand uh, what happens in, in um, uh, during the uh, deformation of pressure vessel steels. 
And what we can see here, we can use imaging to understand the nucleation and growth of voids. And of course, there's lots of models. The, um, the Gerson model is well developed to try and predict the tensile ductility of steels. But in a, in a nuclear pressure vessel steel, you often have high constraints. So the crack is highly constrained. And we wanted to understand how do, how do the voids nucleate and how do the voids grow? I'm going to ju just show a part of that. that We've done work at different levels of triaxiality. So we've done essentially uniaxial tension, but we've also done experiments where, the, where there's very large amounts of triaxiality. And this is just looking at a large inclusion. So this is a large inclusion, a manganese sulfide particle probably in the material. And you'll watch as we deform the material, which is the blue curve, you watch this, uh, you'll see this, the, 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 the void grow. So under tension, you watch the void will start to grow um, and uh, becomes elongated under the extensive plastic flow. And it starts to tilt because as you as it shears, as you form a neck, the the in, include the void uh, tilts. To, because of the rotation in the neck. So we can see very large strains in, the, in that particular void. And that void is now man, many tens of microns in length. But what we also see is many small voids that nucleate from the semen type particles. So here you can see in the same, in the same material, but in slightly different region where the hydrostatic stress is very high and there's a large amount of uh, necking, you can see that small voids, many, many small voids are nucleating and growing from, from, from the semen type. And we can relate that to the microstructure. So here you can see a large void. In red, this is using serial sectioning. So we've serial sections this sample. The red shows the large void. Oh, sorry, I didn't get that right. So I hope I can run that one. Maybe that one doesn't want to run. That one just doesn't want to run. OK, I'm not going to be able to run that one. What I was hoping to show you was that you maybe you can just see it. That's just beneath the surface. You can see a large void there. So there's the large void. But what we also see is lots of small voids between the semen type that will open up as we deform the sample. So we get a lot of small voids between the semen type and these large voids. And it, in, in certain steels in different in different conditions, either the semen type small voids are important or the large voids are important in determining the ultimate coalescence and, 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 uh, and failure. One last experiment looking at high speed imaging. You can see here that the high speed imaging of a uh, uh, material that, uh, again, I, I, you can just see that. So the, on the left, we have the X-ray imaging. So this is the this is a magnesium alloy being uh, additively manufactured. You can see the liquid region, the turbulent liquid region. And you can see on the right, a, a colleague of mine, Tom Flint, has been doing modeling of that turbulent zone. And this is a full physics model. So it includes all the physics and there are almost no fittable parameters in this process. And you can see that the shape of that uh, liquid and turbulent zone is very similar between the two, two images. But what we were interested in really was understanding the defects. And, and in this material, you find two types of defects, flat, uh, flat defects, which are um, uh, lack of fusion defects. And you see round defects, which are uh, largely ga uh, gas porosity defects. And you can see micrographs at the top of, of both of those. And what we wanted to do was to understand how this takes place. This work was done with, with Sam Thomas Williams and Phil Prangnell and Ian Todd at Sheffield. And we wanted to characterize the voids, characterize their location and understand how these grow. So uh, the first thing we tried to do was to look at hipping and see if we could actually get the hipping to remove the voids. And one of the interesting things you see here in this case, that when you hip the material, the void that you can see in the left-hand image more or less disappears upon hipping. But when you heat treat it, the, the pore reopens. So it shows that although the pore has been closed, there's some gas pressure in there that when you heat treat it, it causes the pore to regrow at the same location. Not as large as it was in the first place, but it, it does regrow. So understanding the dynamics of the clo clo of hipping and, 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 the, and the process for removing voids is, it can be important. But what we then went on to do was to characterize the material. And this is a tensile sample. And you can imagine you're looking down 
on a tensile sample. What we can see is in, in red is the voids that have been segmented from the X-ray CT image. And what you can see in the gray is the crack growth. So what we've done is to image every every thousand cycles and you can see how the crack grows every thousand cycles. And, and you can see that in this case, it's grown from a surface breaking void, uh, a surface breaking pore, a surface breaking pore, but these two have, have formed from internal voids. And we can see the rate at which they grow, uh, how they interact with one another if you get multiple cracks and try and, and produce uh, uh, simple models to understand the lifetime of these parts, because clearly uh, if you've got a distribution of voids, you get a distribution of fatigue lines. And trying to understand the life of these materials is really, really important. So uh, we were able to study those, those voids, understand where they, where they occur. What we found was that the voids near the surface are much more potent than voids in the interior. And we are able to use machine learning to try and understand what's important. Is it the distance from the surface? Is it the area of the void? Is it the proximity of other voids and so forth? And what you find, not surprisingly, is that the area of the void is a primary interest, but the distance to the surface is, is re really critical and the aspect ratio of the void is slightly less important, but can be important. But, but obviously what we can then do is take our fatigue data. So this just shows the stress range on the left, cycles to failure. And as you might expect, each sample is different. Each sample gives very different uh, results because of the inherent pores that are trapped in the material. And if we look at the failure of each one, we can, this was work was done by, uh, by John Yates at Sheffield. You can see that the longest lives are for the, for the defects, which are the smallest and the largest defects give the shortest lives. And you can see that just a simple model plots very well with the size of the defects. What we also see is that this defect, for example, which was a large defect, but an internal defect is clearly a lot less uh, potent than even this small defect that you see. Uh, so that's an external defect and that's an internal defect. So we can start to say, well, just how good does the material be? have to be if you want to have a certain fatigue life and a certain probability of failure. So traditional fracture mechanics can really explain a lot about, about the behaviors. Okay, I've, been, uh, sh I've shown you a lot of examples and I hope I've given you some ideas. I'm sure some of the things you may have already tried yourselves, but I think the bringing together of electron microscopy and uh, X-ray imaging is a really powerful way to understand uh, the role of defects, to understand how where corrosion starts, and, and to start to build temporal models. And of course, we can then build a finite element, element models that capture that microstructure. So we can use the images we acquire in the primary state to create 3D models, whether that's the to, to model the growth of a defect, or to uh, whether that's to uh, to model the growth of corrosion films and, and, and corrosion effects. So we can really not only just collect a 3D and 4D picture of what's going on, we can use that to develop finite element models or other physics-based models that predict the behavior. I think, you know, clearly correlative imaging is important because materials are hierarchical. You know, it's not, it's not good enough to simply understand a material at the macro scale, and it's not simply good enough to understand it at the atomic scale. We often have some critical length scales that are important, and uh, whether that's the length scale of a microstructurally short crack, or whether that's the micro scale of the coating, or the micro scale of the inclusions or the precipitates, we need to be able to image those and, and use different techniques to build up the picture. I think it helps us also one of these methods help us to locate very rare events because we can do volume imaging. If the if we have a rare event, if you just take a slice, there's a good chance you won't find it. But if you've got a 3D image, you can see um, the statistics much more reliably. So you can you can follow rare events and you can follow. Uh, for example, you don't just have to follow the critical defect. You might want to understand why do some critical some defects grow quickly 
but simply slow down? And how can we learn something about the defects that slow down? Can we learn something about why certain certain defects suddenly become active and grow much more quickly? So lots of things we can do to understand the, 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 the dynamics of degradation. Automated zoom tomography is at the moment really difficult. You can imagine that if you've got an object that might be, you might have a fan blade that could be, you could have a composite fan blade that could be, you know, hundreds of, of millimeters across, and you may want to study wrinkles or defects at, or, or the failure of Z pins at a very fine scale. So the ability to be able to image at large scale and then and then use that as contextual imaging for high resolution imaging, maybe by X-ray or by electron microscopy is really, really useful. So, I mean, when I was a PhD student and I started on an electron microscope, we take our three millimeter disc and we'd image it and we'd assume that whatever we saw there was representative of the whole object. Now we can see large areas, we can survey different areas. It would be rather like landing on the world and, and, and just landing at random in one spot and assuming that whatever you see from your window will tell you about the whole of the, uh, the whole of the world. Or it would be like landing on a football pitch and looking at a few blades of grass. Sometimes you need to be able to stand back and see the big picture and see the, the mowing marks and the lines and the structures. So being able to combine modes is really important, if only to understand the context of something you're going to study at high detail. I think really we are moving to machines that are now much more automated. So it's now in, it's now possible to not only run a machine autonomously and go and have a break while it's acquiring and for it to do all the focusing and the moving of the sample and acquiring the sample, all the images you need, but it's also possible to go and find things that you found earlier. So you might be able to set up workflows that are much more complicated than you could ever do before. And then the last point I'd like to make is that, you know, large 3D data sets are really valuable. And at the moment, it's really hard to store them anywhere. And I would encourage you, if you're collecting 3D data sets, think about where to store them, because you may be studying one aspect about that 3D data set, but that 3D data set could be really valuable to somebody else. It would be like somebody who goes and measures the grain size but doesn't doesn't capture the 3D data. Somebody else may need to know the texture or they may want to look at particular grain boundaries or they may want to, to, to look for particular defects or features. So storing of data is increasingly important and, and giving it a DOI so that people can go away and find it and download it, I think is really important. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Phil, for a wonderful uh, talk. And definitely we always welcome you whenever you yeah. Come, come this side, you please visit us. Um, and I open the session for any questions from. Let me ask you a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I'll I'll see see you. I was yeah. talking yeah. about you recently. <laughs> oh, yeah, I came to know. From Did you see that? that? Yeah, I, I said, I know this guy who's really interested <laughs> in additive manufacturing. So oh, I yeah. said, yeah, I was in, uh, I was speaking to people from GKN at the European yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I just got an email. I need to respond to that email anyway. <laughs> <I'm> sorry about <laughs> Thank that. You, Phil. It's always a pleasure to listen. You know, uh, your talk is uh, a pleasure. Uh, I have a couple of questions, so maybe I speak up now because I'm, I'm meeting later. So um, the first thing is, I mean, I like CT scan, and we want to implement it in additive manufacturing. Yeah. For example, for regular production. So yes. How how can we make cost effective? I mean, I was giving recently in GE symposium for NDT. And where, uh, I mean, one of the things, just an example, we may we produce one part traditionally by forging. Yes. The defect acceptance criteria there is 1.2 millimeter. Yeah. Whereas when we change it into AM, because AM is thousands of weld beads, if yes. not millions of weld beads into the yeah. So they want to, again, the static damage tolerance point of view, the defect may occur anywhere. So they want, they reduce the defect acceptance criteria down to, you know, 250 micron from yeah. 1.2 millimeter to 250 micron. Yeah. And this is where the, the complexity comes. I can't use the traditional yes. 2D X-ray because you only, you know, 20% no. of through yeah, And yeah, then yeah. I want to use the CT, but yes. the cost the cost of the CT is becoming so expensive. Right. Are there effective ways of, you know, uh, yeah. making use of CT into uh, uh, this thing? Way, and 
Yes, I think that is definitely there's definitely a, there are definitely approaches coming out at the moment. I don't know yeah. if you know of, of I mean, we, we 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 would be very happy to do some studies, but we're talking with a company called Adaptics who make okay. a tomosynthesis tomosynthesis system. Now the advantage with tomosynthesis, you can see my hands, yeah. So the yeah. advantage with tomosynthesis, you have a series of a, a, a series of uh, sources on one plane. And you you put your object in the middle and you have a detector at the bottom. Now, you don't get a full 3D view, but you get a view which is probably, you know, significantly better than than a radiograph. And you can also tell something about the depth. So you would know not just do you have a defect, but is that defect near the top surface or the bottom surface? And I think that holds some promise. We're doing a little bit of work at the moment to look at additive and and also composite materials to try and understand that. And I mean, I'd be happy to share contacts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that, you know, in that particular project, Everything else we fixed it, but the crack yeah. growth rate, track the toughness, then you know, and of course everything. the devil but is the in the detail. What size was what basically size it. But in principle, yeah. it would be an interesting challenge. Yeah. 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 And and also I spoke to you know one of the GE guy as well. But the, I didn't understand what he said. They tried to fix 29 or 30 parts in a round mandrel and then exposing it like a panoramic. Yes. By doing so, they can reduce the cost and then count to they can re- decrease it. I don't know if that sort of Facility, have you ever come across? I, if that's I, the yeah, I haven't seen that one, but I have seen the rapid scan system, which takes okay. a whole series of images. So what that one does is it takes a whole series of images to create a, a, a single image. So I, I, but I'm I'm not familiar with the GE one now. Okay. No. But, but yeah, there are a number of ways of doing it by using multiple beams or collecting yeah. uh, information with with a number of angles simultaneously, so that. Because obviously there's two problems. One is the infrastructure cost, the, the machines yeah. are expensive. The other is the time of just putting the sample in, doing the imaging, doing the reconstructions. The yeah. nice things about the tomosynthesis, for example, is you, you, you just put it on the machine, it takes very quickly, fires the images, no moving yeah. part, and then you get a, a reconstruction in a few seconds. So that, that could be useful for diagnosing what you, what you want to do. Yeah. yeah. I'd be interested in case if you're going to put yeah. something for it or bringing it to UK, we would be happy to support our Yeah, well if you have some project. if you have some interesting samples, we could perhaps discuss it. I'm sure Adaptics would be interested. Mm. Yeah. And my second question is, you know, you had a tannis. Uh, yes. Up to what temperature you can do in situ heating and well, we can go at the moment to um I think seven or eight hundred degrees. I think oh, something okay. like that. Yeah. Thank you. It may be yeah. higher, but it's certainly at least seven hundred. We've done seven hundred, so I know it goes okay. to seven hundred. Thanks, Alphonse. You st- could you please go ahead with your question? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, hi, and a p- p- pleasure to hear your uh, presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I, had a, I had a few questions. The uh, first is uh, I, I worked with uh, uh, Dr. Parakash together on a DH and, and steels with uh, retained austenite, so small retained austenite islands. And the first question is, uh, could you, for example, monitor on the in situ deformation and the transformation of retained austenite? Yes. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, what are you thinking of? Are you thinking of uh, sort of uh, temporal, watching it in, 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 uh, over time or, or are you thinking of watching it in 3D? What, what, what's your interest? Yeah, well, both could be interesting, really, from a scientific point of view, to see what's happening. Uh, we we have developed yeah. the steels. Um, yeah, I have many more questions, if if I'm yeah. allowed, of course. <laughs> I think I think certainly certainly it's possible to 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 to, to see the tra- retained austenite. It's, it's not. It's a bit tricky. Obviously, retained austenite is one of the more challenging problems crystallographically to differentiate, but it is possible. Yes. But yeah. Was, yeah. 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 And and then the second question is uh, of course uh, welding and uh, I, I think with Parkash uh, we, we we discussed it is uh, for example looking at liquid metal and brittle and like a zinc uh, over grain boundaries uh, uh, how 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 would that work but then in situ it w- would would that be possible to to yeah to 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 yeah. think of experiments or. Yeah, just give me a moment. That's our that's our standard alarm. We always have it on t- uh, t- at two o'clock. So that's just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. So can you just repeat that question? It was hard to hear. Yeah. So is uh, is um, uh, when you have like welding and liquid metal and brittlement, yes. uh, um, um, is the is that a subject where where where, where you you could three D say like this uh, see the the imaging of of zinc while you welding and cool it down? Yes. 
that that is see? definitely possible in 2D. So if if, if a lot of in the 2D. Okay. yeah the 2D images are e relatively easy. Doing something in 3D is more difficult simply because you have to rotate the sample. But certainly 2D is definitely possible. And people in the in Japan and so forth have done work looking at this kind of thing. So yeah, that's definitely possible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and at, at, at Tata Steel, we are looking, of course, at, at using our steel with uh, battery packs and lithium battery packs. Yes. Now, uh, would there be, uh, for example, experiments with, for example, uh, high temperature lithium um, uh, in presence of lithium and to see how the steel reacts? Is that something? Because lithium has a very low Z uh, value. Yeah. I, I'm just yeah. thinking on leads on yeah. projects that we could lithium with cooperate steel. With, uh, with the three of us. Yeah. With x-rays, lithium and uh, lithium for steels is, is very difficult. Yeah, lithium and steels are difficult because the lithium has very low scattering and the and the steel has high scattering. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I think that's that would be a big challenge. Um, we've done lithium in batteries, but uh, but not in not in steels. So um, that that might be a little bit difficult to do. But um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the third question is uh, boron and steel. What? What? How? How far? <laughs> <laughs> Again, are you looking? Uh, do you want to? Do you want to look at segregation of boron in steels? Is that what you're looking at? And you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, we have a certain thermal nonlinear cycles where we go, for example, up to 800 degrees with rapid heating and rapid cooling, because that was the next question. And uh, where we add, for example, boron in certain steels, and I will be interesting in situ what's happening. And that that's the, that leads to the next question: uh, What are your heating and cooling rates in a non linear uh, thermal annealing cycles yeah well i mean obviously in different on, on different experiments you could different methods you get different cooling rates in the in the laser heating the, in the additive manufacturing cases you get very fast cooling rates because of course you have a big substrate and you can uh, you can you can draw the heat out very quickly um in cases where we sometimes we use uh, conductive heating and if you're using conductive heating yeah, of course. a little longer so and of course uh, in the test scan we have heated ends so we just heat the ends of our sample and then we allow conduction to co co to cause the heating and the cooling um but it, yeah I, I mean i think it's all like often it's a case of can you think of a good in situ rig uh can can we come up with something that allows yeah. access to the beam and a lot but it, these things are definitely something we could do uh, in discussion if you wanted to come up and spend an, an hour or we could do it on online yeah. i'm sure there's some really interesting things we could do yeah sure yeah. sure sure yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. i would always be interested yeah sure and i can see uh practice is getting restless so uh, no 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 <laughs> I, I, I am getting restless because i know you are busy and i have a question to ask so that's why so i will stop um, my questions thank you so much <laughs> yeah you're very welcome to, if you wanted to come up or bring a team up to discuss some experiments you're very welcome to do so um sure, yeah. sure. yes yeah Oh, okay. Phil, um, my question is like if you see most of the X-ray tomography worked very well with uh, systems like aluminum, copper, all that where yeah. there is a good contrast to understand yeah. in situ grains, uh, all that. But is there any development uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, determining the volume fraction of eutectic structure? For example, in aluminum silicon system, it is very difficult to separate uh, silicon eutectic from aluminum. So do you think this diffraction contrast tomography or any other new techniques uh, would be helpful in understanding those those systems? I mean, people often use phase contrast uh, yeah. The, uh, CT to try and differentiate, but I think again, what what it, you know what it's worth doing is having a having a go to see okay. what, what one can do. Uh, so if you have samples, I mean, obviously you, one thing you can do is talk to Jay at um, at uh, Warren yeah, yeah. be able to help. But also we can if well, things that are really difficult are often best done at the synchrotron because the the quality of the image at the synchrotron is lower noise. So if yeah. you've got a, if you've got something that's really hard to to pick up uh, and you've got you've got more phase contrast because you've got a more coherent beam and you've yeah. got less noise so sometimes things you can't do in the lab you can still do at the synchrotron but uh, we have a team the nxct we have two of two guys out at the esrf all the time and we have some links with diamond so if you wanted to if you think something might be too difficult sometimes it's better rather than put a proposal in just have a go at something and see whether it's worthwhile before you apply for some beam time. And that would be possible to have a look at. Yeah. 
Um, I, mean, I gave a couple of samples to Sashi, I think D13 diamond, I13 at diamond. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we we got images, but still extracting information of eutectic from iron yeah. recycling, intermetallics, everything is becoming clumsy because yeah. it, so that's where the challenge is to yeah. how to extract the. And of course, things are moving on in terms of segmentation because now with people are using uh, machine learning much more. And I mean, things are getting th things are going in the right direction. They're getting easier to do. So it, 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 it might be worth having a look at those images to see whether yeah. that feasible or not. And sometimes, of course, you you might need a bit of um, post-mortem analysis to um, benchmark. And then you, you know, once you've got, because you may be in, you know, once you once you've got something benchmarked, you then may be able to apply that method to to more difficult experiments or to 3D experiments. So that can sometimes be worthwhile doing. But but yeah, it, it, it it's it, it's much more difficult because you're you obviously the contrast is low. Yeah. 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 Okay.